Hello guys, welcome back to another video, and today we are continuing our series on the elites tier lists. Today we're doing Germany. So, you know the drill with uh, how I do my ratings. Um, it's heavily influenced by potential to be broken, um, not necessarily what is currently broken, um, or what is currently meta, because you can have broken things that are not meta. So. Uh, starting off, we have Africa Core. So, Africa Core is probably the best of the choose one of three. Um, just because you have a lot of really heavy hitter cards that have a huge impact on a game, um, and your opponent is usually expecting you to only have one of them. Or you don't don't have it in your deck, but it's really good in that particular matchup. So, for example, you might not be running King Tiger because your deck isn't that heavy. However, you're playing against Soviet control, so you know that if you play a King Tiger, you probably win the game like 9 times out of 10. So, Africa Core into King Tiger, Africa Core into a second Leopold is obviously always good. Africa Core into Comet, Africa Core into Heinkel, Jäger Bomber. But there is so many good German elites that you are almost always seeing at least one card you are fine running in your deck, and there's like 30% of the time you get an absolutely insane card to have two copies of because you are already running it in your deck. So I'm going to put it up in 2, or uh, 2, uh, B, because I don't, I don't think I can put it into A. Um, it is just... The problem with these cards is they're a little heavy. Um, so what I mean by that is, would you rather run Africa Core or would you rather run King Tiger? The answer is you'd probably rather run King Tiger, um, just because, like, if that's your one big card, your one huge threat at the end of the game, because... You need it into control matchups, and Africa Core is not going to give it to you 100% of the time. So then it goes, well, do you want to run Africa Core and King Tiger? And it's like, okay, maybe, but you're starting to run quite a lot of elites. Um, like, you're, you're starting to run quite a lot of threats, and the thing with Africa Core is it's really good at giving you sort of like a huge or even mid-range threat, but there's not a lot of good just, like, cheap cards to throw at the opponent. Um, like, there's not really any, like, Raiding Brigade type of cards. I guess Panzer L is sort of the closest thing you get. Um, and you're spending the two credits on it at some point, so it's really a value generation card, and Germany typically does not lack for value. Um, so, and, and obviously sometimes you're going to be offered, like, Blom and Voss, Greif, or Nakshub, um, and you don't want any of them. So, yeah, that's why I'm going to leave it down in B tier. Uh, then we have the Auto Canone. Um, this is, I believe in my original tier list, I actually had the Auto Canone up at A tier, like the very end of A tier. Um, I'm going to leave it at the very top of B tier this time, I think. I don't think it's top notch. It's a very good card. A 3-3 three, three, uh, Artie is just a really good stat line. We've, there's two um, three, like conditional 3-3 three, three Arties with the um, Vespe and the um, Priest in the US and Germany. Uh, and both of those are like, okay. And those are conditional 3-3 three, three Arties with no other effects. This is a always a 3-3 three, three Artie with a very good positive effect. Um, so, yeah, the Auto Canone is great. Uh, I've run it in, like, CA, Heinz. I also run it in Control. Um, this is especially good if you're running Gathering Storm, because it's a second artillery to throw in there um, to maximize the chance, or not maximize, but to increase the chances that Gathering Storm is going to drop four. Um, and, like, you're fine running this in, like, a German Italy control deck, because you play it. And your opponent trades into it, so you basically play a 3-cost, three 3-3, three, three, remove something. Um, or you play it and your opponent can't kill it, in which case you can get, like, Mary Nostrum on this, and you just start, like, absolutely obliterating your opponent's board. Um, yeah, never... It's one health off of be, have being a Sexton stat line. 
Like, never, never underestimate the strength of Ardu. Um, however, I don't think you can quite call it Cornerstone. Um, so we're going to leave it up at the top of B. Then we have Bismarck, which is absolutely terrible. Um, 7 damage for 10 cost is just not good. And yes, you can run this in a burn deck. And it, it's going to be fine in a burn deck. However, it is still just because it is the biggest burn card in the game, not because it's good. Like, just because you could run this in a burn deck does not mean that it is anything other than terrible. Because there's even people who cut this in a burn deck. Like, that, it, yeah, like, Fortification, 3 cost, heal 7. Marinostrum, 1 cost, heal, like, 20. Bismarck, 10 cost, deal 7. Like, if you're playing against an opponent who doesn't have healing, this is can be, like, an okay finisher, but... Why would you play this when you can play, like, Leopold, reset the board, and allow you to get a ton of damage face with your units? Or, like, Comet, which you can start playing from turn 6, and after two attacks, you have done more damage than Bismarck. Um, yeah, just just an awful card all around. Uh, then we have the Blomenvoss, which I'm going to put in C tier. It's just, it's a weak card. Um, it's difficult to hold up a ton of countermeasures when you play this. And even if you do, your opponent will usually only trigger one before killing it. So, like, if you have an entrapment up, your opponent will attack into the entrapment with his first unit, it will die, you draw a card, and then he will kill it with his second unit. Or, he'll try to kill it with an order, and you have, like, a secret operatives, and then he'll kill it with a different order. So, it is common for this card to not draw at all, and it is rare for this card to draw more than one. And... I mean, I think this card would have to draw two consistently to be even partially good, and it's that's being good in a bad deck, because countermeasure decks are not good, and you have to be running a lot of countermeasures for this to be good. Um, also, the fact that it's an elite just kind of makes it weird, because you need to run other draw in your deck regardless. You can't rely on an elite to be, like, a huge draw card in your deck. Um, so then we get to envelop... And I'm I'm tempted of putting it I'm tempted to put envelop in the top of C tier, just because it's it's a very powerful effect. Like destroy all the units in a particular line is a huge effect. Considering destroy a targeted unit, one targeted unit costs six. Destroy a random targeted unit costs four. Destroy a uh, the first unit your opponent moves to the front line costs two. Destroy the first unit your opponent plays costs two. And this is three. Destroy all units in the front line when your opponent moves into it. So the effect for the cost is insane. However, if your opponent has been playing this game for any amount of time and has seen this card before, they're just going to play around it. Like, they're just not going to move units to the front line if they have units there. If they don't have units there, they're going to move the weakest thing to the front line, in which case you played a three-cost missing. Um, and, yeah, it forces you to hold up three credits every turn. And Germany tends to really want to play on curve, more so than most nations. So holding up three cost for envelop every turn is difficult. You have potential to run it in the current meta, just because everyone's decisive defense has become really popular. So if you see Germany floating three credits, you're more likely to think, it's decisive defense, I'm going to flood the front line and not attack face. And then you blow them out with envelop. I know I've certainly been in positions where I'm like, I'm like mostly sure it's decisive defense. However, if it is envelop, I'm going to lose the game. Um, So like maybe I can put it up to B tier. It does feel wrong to put a card that just has such a powerful effect in C tier. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll put it at the back of B tier. We will see. Then we have Exploit the Gap. This card is terrible. Um, yeah, it requires you to have the front line. And then it cho you choose one of three units from your deck to drop its cost to zero and give it Blitz. Uh, and draw it, obviously. However, you need to have the front line, which means you need to be running units capable of taking the front line by turn 6, because you really want to be playing this card on curve. Um, which means you're running cheap units, 
and also enough cards to contest your opponent trying to take the front line, which means it's going to be fairly often that you exploit the gap is going to offer you like an Akshub and like 235Ts or whatever cards you're running, like an Akshub, two Flam Panzers, an Akshub, Flam Panzer, Panzer H, or whatever. And that's just bad. Um, yeah, it's very difficult to get this card to work. Um, and I see it having very little potential in the future outside of, like, OTK decks. Um, and even then, it's hard to imagine this being used in a particularly good OTK deck. Um, now, obviously, the, you'll have, like, a game or two where you get blown out by an opponent running this because they play, like, a turn six Leopold or, like, they blitz out a King Tiger and give him a bolster and hit you for, like, 16 or whatever, 14. Um... But, yeah, at the end of the day, Exploit the Gap is just not particularly good. Um, it needs a huge rework. This card actually used to cost 7. It's been buffed since it came out. Um, so, yeah, not good. Then we have the Falsham Jaeger. Um, I suppose I'm going to put this in C tier, because it's better than Bismarck and Exploit the Gap, in that if you run a Bismarck and Exploit the Gap in your deck, it is more often than not just going to be a card that sits in your hand, is never played, and is just all around terrible. Whereas Falsham Jaeger, you can play out almost whenever, and oftentimes it's going to be okay. Because like, two damage, or like three credits, deal three damage to the front line. Okay effect. Very, very occasionally, it will be four credits, deal six damage to the front line, because you get to double trade. Um... Sometimes you can get it to the front line and threaten, like, crazy burst with Blitzkrieg. So, it, it, the problem with Falsher Baker is there's just not really a deck that wants to run it. It's not necessarily a bad card, it's just, like, a slightly subpar card in terms of synergies in every single German deck. So, yeah, I, I don't really see that changing, it's just sort of, like... It, it's weird, because it's not a bad card. It's not. It doesn't need, like, a massive buff. It doesn't need to become, like, a 3-3 three, three or a 4-2 or zero operation cost or anything. Like, it's just an okay card. Um, but, yeah, you don't run okay cards, um, generally speaking. So, I'm going to leave it in C tier. I think I'll actually move it ahead of Blom and Voss, because, again, Blom and Voss can be... Like, if you're just going to play it out as a unit, you'd probably prefer Falsham Jaeger to a 2-4. Um, and Blitz is a very good effect because it lets you do something immediately. Like, sometimes you're going to be playing against air and you'd rather have a fighter. But most decks will take the front line, so even if this is just 3 credits removed something to the front line, that's fine. That's often what Flying Bomb does. And Flying Bomb, uh, as we will see, is one of the best cards. Then we have Fast Hinds. Um, Fast Times I'm going to put in C tier. It's... It is well past its glory days. There's too many... It's not necessarily that German... Tanks... Got... Worse. Like, I think they've survived the nerfs pretty well. Um, obviously the nerf to Fast Times was huge. A long time ago, Fast Times used to be give all your German tanks plus two plus one. They didn't have to be in the front line. So you would just stack tanks in the support line and then you'd play fast times and then and like a grife and then move everything up at once um so yeah it's not a terrible card it's just kind of hard to utilize because the the effect is often not huge and you're wasting a card on it so like for example um the pans Panzer G? Panzer... Yeah, I want to say Panzer G. The one that uh, gives your tanks plus one, plus one. Uh, and the German tank splits. That card is plus one, plus one to all tanks. Fast Hines is plus two, plus one to tanks in the front line. And the difference is two credits, fair enough, but that two credits gives you a 3-3 three, three body that permanently gives... well gives your other German tanks Blitz, which, if you have a Panzer F, um, is going to be buffing their attack additionally on top of Fast Hines. So it's sort of just like Fast Hines has been replaced by slightly better cards, and other nations now have more 
and better cards to contest the front line, and there's more decks out there contesting the front line, which means it's harder to run orders which exclusively work in, by giving you bonuses in the front line. Like, why would you... You much prefer to run Blitzkrieg now, because it's you get the front line, and then you finish the game. Whereas Fast Hides is... It's slower. Um, yeah. So... It's not a terrible card, it's just sort of been outclassed since it was nerfed. Um, then we get to From the Deep. I mean, I think From the Deep is an A-tier card for me. This card is just so powerful, um, because your, t your opponent will often not have the ability to play around it. Because it essentially just stops your opponent from playing units on curve. And there's a lot of decks that want to play units on curve. Like, there's a lot of very powerful units to play on curve. As well as there's a lot of decks that don't have a ton of units, and therefore don't have, like, the tiny unit to sack out every time they want to play something important. So, like, Japan France Resistance would be a good example of this. They don't have a ton of units to just play out whenever you hold up two credits. So you'll probably hold up two credits purposefully or not at various points of the game, and if they have, like, a Kika or a Shiden in hand or something, they'll probably play out, like, a Raiding Brigade or a Siren first. It doesn't trigger. You kill that. And then you hold up two credits again. And, like, every time you they, you are forcing them into a position where it's like, do I play my Kawadishi and win the game if there's not from the deep? Or do I play my Kawadishi and instantly lose the game because it dies to a two-credit character measure? And two credits is sort of in the sweet spot. Um, where I think three, it's usually very... I think it's a lot harder to pull off three credits, floating three credits, just with how curves work, how, like, going up to 12 credits works. I find it is much more common to float two credits than it is to float three credits. Um, and most of, like, like Envelop, uh, Decisive Defense, Counter-Strike, Ultra, are all cost three credits, and you're almost always aware your opponent has them and play around them, and the ones that see play are just good even if your opponent plays around them. Whereas from the deep, it's very often for your, you to just float two credits and your opponent's forced to play around it, or you hold it up and your opponent doesn't play around it because they're like, well, he might just be holding up two credits. Um, so I think from the deep is one of the best uh, character measures in the game. Um... Like, the, the effect itself, destroy a unit, is not great, but it's just so, such a good interruption because um, it, like, stops Blitz units, it stops uh, passive effects like Kawadishi. Um, it doesn't dis stop deployment effects, but it can stop, like, deployment effect combos. Um, so, yeah, From the Deep is just a great card. I am I can't imagine ever not running this in a German control deck. Um, obviously, it doesn't fit into every German deck ever, because Agro's never going to want to run this. But it, it's not broken. It, it's just like a solid card. It's sort of like what you want in an Elite. Then we get to Grife, which is going straight to Strictly Broken. And you might think this weird, because I don't value Heinz particularly high as a deck, and I put Fast Heinz, the card, in weak C tier. Um, however, Grife, just the effect on its own, is one of the most broken effects in the game. Because tanks spend a credit to move and a sp credit to attack. Well, they can spend a credit to move and a credit to attack in the same turn. So, if you have two tanks in the support line and you play Grife on turn two. So, like, turn one you play a Panzer A, and on turn two you play a Panzer A and a Grife. That Grife is one credit, give you four credits on that turn to move an attack with both tanks. And if it sticks around, it is going to be giving you an additional two credits, plus credits for the operation and attack of any additional tanks you play, most of which have Blitz, which means you can like play like a Whirlwind. And instead of costing four credits to move an attack, it costs two. So that's Grife giving you an additional two credits. And credit gain is incredibly powerful. It's one of the most powerful effects in the game, and it's one of the effects we have seen most commonly nerfed in the game. Whether ways to generate credits, or ways to reduce the credit cost of cards, or ways to get cards out for free. So we've seen that with the Mountain Rifles 
nerf that gave you a free 5-5. We've seen that with war production nerf uh, and supply chain, or not war production nerf, sorry, supply chain nerf, which was giving you zero cost draw. Um, we saw that with the pioneer nerf, reducing cards costs from one to zero, which was way too powerful. Um, yeah, there's just been a ton of nerfs to cards like that. However, there's never been a nerf to Grife, because this card is insane. Um, like, for example, this card could be a one cost, two two one two maybe one three and reduce the operation cost of your tanks by one to a minimum of one and that card would suck like that card i mean you'd maybe still run it if you run a lot of two operation cost cards but that card would suck so i don't know how you change this card drast without changing it like com to completely drastically or without gutting it uh if you want to nerf it but currently it's broken but on the plus side, the deck it is broken in is not super powerful. Um, so as long as there's not too many buffs to Heinz, this card can stay broken, I suppose. Like, if you ever see a Heinz game where they draw a Grife, like in their first like three cards, their win rate is probably like 80%. And if you ever see a Heinz game where they never draw a Grife, their win rate is probably like 40%. It's absurd. Um, but then we move on to Admiral Hipper. Um, which I'm going to put into A tier. Admiral Hipper is just a pretty good card. It's not broken, um, but it's just solid all-around value card for a value-oriented... Um, well, not necessarily value, but a, uh, it, like, it is starving your opponent of resources um, in their hand, not in their overall deck. Germany never tries to win on fatigue. Uh, Germany tries to win on ability to access resources. Uh, and Hipper works perfectly fine with that. Um, if you can play this on curve, it's like all of the other credit denial cards in the game. Playing them on curve is pretty good. Um, the effect is return a unit to hand. This can be your own unit, and it will still credit deny your opponent, which on its own, if it was just return a unit to hand credit deny, that card would be not great for five credits. However, additionally to that, they also don't draw a card. Um, so what that means is if your opponent has, your opponent has no units on board and they play a five cost card from their hand as their best play on turn five and you play Hipper on it, essentially what has happened is, because their best play is still going to be to just replay that five cost card. So essentially what has happened is you have just gained a free credit. You, you have essentially just had a zero cost war machine played at some point in this game without costing you a card in hand. Um, which is just pretty good. And then obviously there's, there's tons of other situations, like if your opponent's turbo buffed a unit, um, if your opponent has out, is out of cards in hand and they play like whatever crappy card they top deck, like a flam answer or something, you hipper it back to hand so they basically don't get another turn. Um, yeah, hipper's just all around pretty good card. Um, I think I would rate it, well, that's hard. Um... Do I rate it lower or higher than From the Deep? Because I feel like Hipper oftentimes has a smaller impact. Um, or at least it's harder to evaluate the impact of Hipper in a game most of the time. Um, I mean, like, we have seen people cut Hipper in the past. Because I think you can build German control without discard. And if you're not running discard, it's not like you need to run this card. I don't think it's... Like, I think it's slightly less auto-include than From the Deep. But maybe I'm, I could be wrong about that. Um, I'll just leave it there. Then we get to Jagd Bomber. Jagd Bomber is great. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd actually yeah, put Jagd Bomber ahead of Admiral Hipper. Jagdbomber is just one of those cards where, they, when they announced it, I saw it and I was like, well, that's just going to be a staple. It's not broken, but that's just going to be a staple in, like, almost every German deck ever. And, sure enough, it has become a staple in almost every German deck ever. Um, because 5 cost 5 4 return a ground unit to hand is just really good. Like, 5 cost 5 4 fighter is a good body. Like, it's not a great body. If it was a vanilla unit, you would not run it. Um, remotely. However, it's just like a pretty good unit 
for an effect which is incredibly powerful. And yeah, ground units means you can return guards to hand. Um, in an aggro deck, it means you can return like artilleries to hand or big buffed units in the front line to hand in like a control deck. Um, yeah, it's it's just a good card. Uh, works in tandem pretty well with wolf pack. If your opponent is out of cards in hand, you can yagd bomb with something back to their hand and then wolf pack it to destroy it. Um, yeah. It, not a whole lot else to say about this card. It's just really good. Um, the reason I rate it slightly higher than Hipper is just because Tempo is king in most card games. Cards is not an exception to that rule. Tempo is king. So it's a very similar effect. Your opponent doesn't lose the credit slot. Your opponent doesn't lose the card draw. However, you got a 5-4 body on the board, which, I mean, if it attacks, that's 25% of your opponent's health. Um, yeah. Yeg Bomber, just an all-around incredibly powerful card that very occasionally single-handedly wins games. Um, then we get on to the Heinkel. Um, Heinkel is also going to be an A-tier card. Heinkel is just insane. Um, I think I would put it below Hipper, maybe. Um, it is, maybe I put it, see, like, I could see this being anywhere in A-tier. Um, actually, yeah, D because of its potential to be run in aggro, um, and especially CA, um, I feel like that does give it quite a bit of a bump, um, maybe even ahead of From the Deep. So the thing with Heinkel is, it's just an incredibly powerful effect, um, on a good body, like, a one cost one two blitz bomber is not something you would run in Germany typically, um, but it's certainly like a stat line where if it has anywhere near a decent effect, you would consider running it. You might even consider running it in Brit Air if it was a British card. Well, sorry, you would almost certainly run it in Brit Air if it was a British card, and no text. Um, but the text is add a spoils of war to your hand whenever it attacks, and a spoils of war is a pretty good card, especially considering Germany has almost no card draw. And the fact that it's every time this attacks means if your opponent can't kill it, you are going to keep drawing and keep drawing and keep drawing. And what Germany really is good at is having threats on the board. So your opponent will often be in a situation where you have a big threat on the board that's attacking for a ton, or if it's like a big Marinostrum unit healing for a ton, or whatever it is. And then you also just throw out a Heinkel and attack for three credits. And now your opponent is forced to, do I kill the Heinkel, or do I deal with the threat? And if they deal with the threat, you can just play down a new threat. You, potentially even a new threat you drew into with the Heinkel, and you attack again with the Heinkel to get another Spoils of War. Uh, and suddenly, this Heinkel has turned into, like, an insane convoy that lets you choose cards from your deck. So, yeah. Heinkel is just an incredibly powerful card. Um, I was actually... I strongly pushed for this to be nerfed when it came out as a 1-3. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's probably fair to say that I'm a big reason that it was nerfed when it was a 1-3. Um, because people, German, I believe it was German Japan Heinz was the best deck in the game at the time. Um, and a lot of people wanted it nerfed, and a lot of people correctly pointed out problem cards, uh, namely for the Emperor. However, the Heinkel had just come out, and people had put it in the deck because it was really good. And some people were saying, like, oh, well, it's good because you can, like, buff its attack and reduce its operation cost with From the Emperor. And, it, yeah, if you know From the Emperor, that no one's going to run Heinkel anymore. But uh, I sort of foresaw that, no, Heinkel is just an insane card that will be run in every single German deck until the end of time. Uh, and the fact that it's a 1-3 makes it incredibly difficult for a lot of decks to deal with the turn it comes out, so you're almost guaranteed getting two draws from it in most matchups if you can play it on turn 3. Um, and, thankfully, they agreed with me. It was nerfed. Um, and since then, it has continued seeing play in every single German deck, however, at a lot more balanced level. If this was still a 1-3, it would probably be an S tier. Um, then we get to King Tiger. Um... King Tiger is going to go into B tier, slightly ahead of Africa Core. Um, I don't think... King Tiger is a weird card, because generally speaking, just huge stat block cards are not that good. 
Um, like, if you saw, I did not rate Persian too highly. Um, I'm not going to rate the uh, Stalin too highly in Soviets. It just huge, flat, big stat units are generally not good, in my opinion. However, there is an exception with King Tiger in that its effect is absolutely insane in very specific matchups. Now, it's a 12-cost card. It takes your entire turn to play this card out. So if you're against anything remotely aggressive, and most mid-range decks, sometimes against mid-range decks, you will have a t time to play this out and then give it Marinostrum and just farm your opponent's board. Um, however, against Aggro, you were never playing this card. But against Control, this card is insane. Against certain types of Control. Because obviously this King Tiger dies to an Avenger, dies to DFA, dies to B-17, dies to High Altitude Bombing. There's a lot of ways to immediately kill this. Uh, Monsoon Rot plus any AoE. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to deal with it. However, do you know what's not a way to deal with it? Lion for a day, Dechima, Partisans, Naval Brigade. So, yeah, it turns out King Tiger is a really, really great counter to Soviet Italy control. In particular, Soviet controls more in general. This is why we have seen a huge rise in ISUs coming back into the meta, in large part to answer King Tigers and King Tiger boards. Um, and yeah... I, I was not a fan of this card when it came out. Um, I strongly argued that, one, it probably should just not exist in such a powerful state, since it is such a polarizing card. It is a card which will almost immediately lose you the game on tempo if you play it against any U.S. control deck. Um, however, it is a card which there is a single card in the entire nation of Soviets that answers it. Um, so, yeah. Not a huge fan of this card. I also 100% argued that it should not be able... It should prevent you from, anybody from playing Orders um, on, in the support line. The same way I think that Panther G and um, Tiger IE should not be able to be targeted by friendly Orders either. Because just having a King Tiger in the support line, and then you put Marinostrum on it, and then you just heal for 11 any time your opponent moves a unit to the front line, is really, really boring it's really, really lame, and it's, like, the problem with Marinostrum being uninteractive is not Marinostrum, it's the cards that you are able to play Marinostrum on. Um, so, yeah. But with all that being said, it's a 12-cost 10-10 tank that doesn't do anything, the tournament play comes out. Um, so, it, it's not a great card. It's not, like, a super broken card. It's just a card that is good enough in matchups that are common enough that you will run it most of the time in a control deck. Um, and it sort of outclassed Tiger IE in that, because Tiger IE costs 8, it's a 7-7, seven, seven, it has a similar effect. Um, it's just sort of like a baby version of the King Tiger. And people ran that because it was really good, um, for the same reason. It was really good against Soviets. Soviets would struggle to deal with the 7-7, seven, seven, even if they, like, they could damage, if they could damage it, they could kill it with a, uh, naval brigade, but it was just difficult to damage. Um, and the reason it sort of started to feel weaker is because it could just die to Dechuma as soon as it came out, and suddenly everyone was running Dechumas, but, yeah. Then we get to Comet, which is going straight to S tier. I think this is one of the single strongest cards in the game right now, and I have been saying that this card needs to be nerfed for a while. Comet is absolutely and utterly insane. It just completely and utterly dominates the certain matchups. Um... In a very deeply, deeply, both unfun and incredibly uninteractive way, in my opinion. And now that is a sliver of the time it's been used. Oftentimes, it's just used as a very powerful tool. Um, it can be used in an aggro deck to just sort of force your opponent to respond to the fact that you were going to kill them in several turns. It can be used as a finisher. Um, you can you obviously run it in every single German control deck. I think anybody who cuts this from German control is absolutely insane. Um, you can use this to farm one attack units, you can use this to farm bombers, both of which there's a decent amount of in the meta. Um, and obviously, the main thing you use this for is continually pressuring face. Now, the reason I say that this is so broken is because not every nation has access to guard, not every nation has access to healing, not every nation has access to countermeasures. Now, there is a fairly even split, every nation will have access to one of those things, um, however, 
that's having access in your collection to cards that counter a single card in a single nation is does not mean that it is broken. I've seen a lot of people's defense of Comet being like, well, just run more guards. And that's that's kind of a silly answer. Like you're playing you're playing a grindy control game. They're going to be playing wolf packs, annihilations, detumas, lion for a days. You're trading your units with their units. And any time you do not have a guard up, your opponent will hit you in the face for four. And you have no way to prevent that if you don't have guards up. And if you play a guard, they will just remove it. Like, people somehow think that you play a guard and then Comet just disappears from the game. Like, you don't need to attack face continually with Comet. They don't reheal all of the health as soon as the guard comes down. Um, and, of course, you end up with matchups like um, I don't know, U.S. Soviet ramp, um, U.S. unit list. I'm not gonna, like, defend unit list too much, um, <laughs> it's a pretty degenerate deck. I'm not saying unit list specifically needs a Comet nerfed, so it is better. Um, but those style of decks where you have air defense, maybe you have air defense and counter-strike, but if your opponent's not an idiot, they're gonna play around those two things, and as soon as those two counter measures are gone, whether they're discarded or triggered, your opponent is just... It's a field day. Your opponent's going to attack face for four every single turn. It's, or Japan France Resistance. Again, not a huge community favorite, but you have very little access to guard, and the deck typically does not run any guard, if at all it's 61sts, which are ridiculously easy to remove. And, yeah, that matchup, the German player will hard mulligan for Comet, and then just play Comet and attack face every single turn from turn six onwards. And essentially just try to win the game before you can, like, get enough threats together, or enough burn together to win the game against you. It it just creates game states where the German player is exclusively attacking face with a card, which your opponent is either very, very, um, like, hindered in interacting with, or straight up cannot interact with whatsoever. It is... It is just stupid that it can attack face. Um, now, you might be saying, like, oh, what do you want it to do? Like, eight credits? That would kill the card. And yeah, sure, that would kill the card. I would actually say, reduce it to five credits and give it the text, ignores guard, and then also give it the text, cannot attack HQ. So you can essentially use it to pick off bombers wherever they are on the board, even if they're protected. It's a great anti-bomber card. Um... You can still use it to sack it into like something like a guarded sexton. Um, you can still just ignore its guard. Attacks the sexton, removes it immediately for five credits. Um, so it's, it's still like a decent card. Maybe it's not an auto include. You'd probably, you'd certainly cut it in aggro. Um, however, it still keeps its functionality. Also makes it just more historically accurate. Um, it, the point of the combat, if you actually look into its history, was never to like go on long-range missions to attack enemy bases. It was like a, um... It was essentially like an interceptor. Like, a, it was a uh, bomber protector. Um, yeah. So, the fact that it is almost exclusively used to deal ridiculous amounts of damage and essentially just end out the game by repeatedly attacking the enemy HQ over and over and over makes zero sense, historically. Anyways, I've ranted about this card for probably too long. So let's move on with the tier list. Kriegsmarine, um, I mean, it's better than Bismarck, um, marginally, because you can pretty consistently deal eight to nine damage, which is already more than Bismarck, plus it costs three less than Bismarck, plus you're discarding a card. Um, however, it's still bad. That just shows how bad Bismarck is, that Kriegsmarine is just a incredibly better version of it, and it's still D-tier. Like, you don't run this in discard because it's seven cost to discard a card, and if you run this in discard, they will have very few cards, because that's the point of discard, meaning you're essentially, spend, you're essentially spending seven credits, deal like two damage, three damage, discard a card, which is not good. Um, and in burn, it's better than Bismarck in burn, like especially like a German-France burn deck, but that doesn't mean it's a good card. Um, so, yeah, not a whole lot else to say about Kriegsmarine. There was a point in time where people ran Kriegsmarine, but that was a point in time where there was almost no healing in the entire game. Um, and if there was healing, 
very few decks ran it because, yeah. So Queen's Marine in a world where there's no healing is a lot better. Um, <laughs> and then we get to Leopold, which of course is going into S tier. Um, I'm actually going to put it behind Gryph, um, just because after all of the expansions, and especially as more expansions continue to come out, the answers to Leopold once it is played is going to become very, very high. So you're essentially spending 10 credits to retreat all enemy units, which is, and as, as people get more and more deployment effects, it's very much becoming sort of a to the last man type of card, where it's like a, oh, you play this out as like the one-time board reset, you know Leopold's gonna die immediately. There's very few games where Leopold sticks around anymore. Um, it's still a ludicrously powerful effect, and if this was printed today, everyone would be calling for it to be nerfed, um, and calling it to be way too strong to be added to the game. But it's just one of those cards that's existed, it's sort of a cornerstone of the cards itself. It's, the, it's like the first elite people complain about um, when they enter the game. So, yeah, obviously it's going into S tier. It's just an incredibly powerful card. However, I don't think it is, like, it is broken in the sense that, like, if you compare it to basically any other card in the game, it's sort of better, or any card in the game that has a even remotely similar effect. It is ludicrously better. However, I don't think it's, I think its impact on the game as a whole is just consistently drop it as more cards come out. Like, it's still going to be run. I'm not saying it's ever going to be cut. It's difficult to imagine a world where you cut Leopold altogether. However, its impact on, like, if you play it, you immediately win the game is certainly dropping. There's still a few decks that are exceptions, but generally speaking, Leopold is becoming more and more in line with other cards as other cards get better and better, and there is no Leopold V2 um, coming out. Then we have Lurking Danger. This is a difficult card to evaluate because it's just a very powerful effect. Um, so drawing specific cards from your deck is generally a good thing. Like obviously, for example, if your Soviets said the only card draw you had is Arctic Convoy back in the day, it's less of a good thing, because you would probably rather have a convoy, because it's difficult to set up decks that it, you want to specifically draw units. However, generally speaking, um, it is an upside on a card if it draws specific cards from your deck. So, if you have a convoy, and you have a... Um, I'm blanking on what the card is, but there's the four cost to draw two orders from your deck. You might say, well, Convoy's better, because it costs one less. Um, which is probably true. However, you're never going to run the other version, because Convoy exists, unless you are specifically draw you want to draw two orders. In which case, it becomes a better Convoy in that deck, because you are specifically looking for these two orders. And that's the same thing with Lurking Danger, except instead of costing one more then Convoy, which is the base three credits draw two, like uh, Arctic Convoy or Second Chance? Is that what it's called? Like a Second Chance? Something like that. Um, which both cost one more than Convoy to draw two specific cards from your deck. This costs one, which is insane. Um, and it's drawing very powerful cards from your deck. Now, obviously, the, the problem with this is you don't run typically run a huge number of countermeasures. Um, in the past, you would often exclusively run from the deep. Um, so you are required to put in additional countermeasures into your deck um, to sort of make this fit. However, the upside is 100% worth it. Um, lurking Danger, one credit, draw two in a deck and a nation that has very, very, very limited card draw is good. And it will get better in the future as they add better and better countermeasures. Countermeasures you don't feel bad about running. Um, so yeah, it's it's not like a game-breaking card. It's just a very, very good card. So I'm going to put it in A tier, um, just because one credit draw two is good. One credit draw two specific cards from your deck is just good. Um, and we get to Schwalb. I'm going to put Schwalb down in B tier. And you might be shocked about this, but, I mean, 
yes, it's a counter to air, and yes, air is and has been the best deck in the game for incredibly long periods of time. However, outside of specifically air, which is a deck that runs almost exclusively air units, this card is... it's okay. Like, most decks will run air units. Um, some decks will run expensive air units. So if you can play this to kill a B-17, it's pretty good. Um, and 7-5 fighter stats, not bad. However, it's not like a game-breaking card. It's not going to be run in every single meta ever. People already have cut Schwalp when Air saw, saw a massive dip in popularity after the um, Finest Hour and Fiat nerfs. So, yeah, I, I'm just going to put it down in B. I'm actually going to put it past King Tiger. I think King Tiger will consistently see more play than Schwalp, and I think King Tiger will consistently have more of an impact on, in an average game than Schwalp. Well... Okay, that's difficult to say because there's a lot of games. There's probably more games where you don't play King... There's significantly more games where you don't play King Tiger than you don't play Schwalb. Um, however, in the games where you do play King Tiger, it will have a much larger impact on the game unless you were specifically playing against air. Um, then we have Hornise, which I'm going to put in C tier, um, but I'm going to put it at the top of C tier. I think Hornise is a little uh, underrated. Like, it is a bad card. It is it is not a great card. I'm not saying throw Hordise into your German control decks. However, I do think it's a little underrated, um, just because German control runs so many unit-based threats that are already kind of difficult to deal with. Um, so if you're trying to build a specifically heavy deck, Hordise is a good choice to throw in, because your opponent isn't going to want to, like, burn a Dechuma to kill this. Your opponent's not going to want to burn... Like, um, I don't know, like a B-17 to kill this. Because you're going to be running King Tigers, you're going to be running Leopolds, you're going to be running Panthugies and JUs, um, Schwalbs, etc, etc, etc. So your opponent doesn't want to kill this. So if you play this in a bo situation where your opponent doesn't have units on board, which is not a difficult situation to get to in at any point in like a past like turn 6-7 uh, as German control... It sort of becomes like this huge threat where your opponent has to gamble. Do I want to give German control draw? Because they lack draw. And if they do draw, am I going to be taking 2 damage from a Sudden Strike? Or am I going to be taking 12 damage from a King Tiger? <laughs> and basically, despite being a 3-4, um, it baits out really big removal. Because your opponent will want to remove it immediately. And if they don't remove it immediately, it's a decent card. Like if this draws one card... It's kind of good. Um, it's sort of like a FW. It's sort of. Like, obviously, it's minus two, minus one in stats, but you and you don't draw immediately. Um, but it, it does damage to the enemy HQ, which could be a good thing. Um, and the added bonus is it will continue to draw if it sticks. Um, now, obviously, there is, like, 52k or tactical strike. There's a couple of ways for your opponent to remove this very easily. Uh, in a way that they will, they will be perfectly fine with. However, there's also a lot of decks that will not be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's not a great card. Like, the reason that it's not great, among other things, is that there's cards like 52k and Tactical Strike that will make it very weak. Um, however, I can see this potentially being playable in the future, or if it receives a little buff, like if this goes down to 6 credits, uh, I definitely think you start to consider this. Um, five credits, 100%, you start to consider this. So, yeah, I think it's better than most people give it credit for, while still being a weak card. Um, then we get to Nakshub. Whoops. Um, Nakshub is a ludicrously powerful card, which is going straight up into A tier. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not quite gonna put it into S tier. Um, the fact that they have limited it to triggering once per turn has brought it back. Previously, it was an S tier card. Um, because again, credit cheating, really, really good. Now, it is quite limited in its ability to cheat credits. However, it has, now that it triggers out orders, you can run it in control much more easily. Um, so yeah, it, it's just going to be a cornerstone card that is run in a lot of German controls. It's not an auto-include because of cards like 989, um, that just sort of punish you for running Nakshub, if, if you play out an early Nakshub. Um... Or, like, countermeasure heavy decks where countermeasures don't trigger Naxxube because it happens on your opponent's turn. 
so yeah, it's just a very good card. Um, not a whole lot else to say about it. Then we have the Panzer L. Um, I think I'm gonna put the Panzer L up into B tier. I I think it's it's just sort of a good card. I mean, it's not quite good enough to be run in every deck. Um, however, it's just a decent stat line. Like, if you get this off of an Africa core, you're often pretty fine with it. I've actually run this card in German control before by taking out a 989, because I was like, this reaches the support line. Yes, it reaches the support line for way more, but you can play it on turn 3, and then reach the support line with it on turn 4, which is pretty good. Um, it's not like a game-breaking card. It's not even a incredibly good card. It's just sort of an okay card, which if you run it in a German control deck, it's not going to be terrible. If you run this in Heinz, it's not going to be terrible. Um, yeah, it's a 3-5 blitz that can pretty easily buff its attack. Um, the two operation costs is sort of the thing that holds this back. If this was a one operation cost, you would run this in basically every German deck ever. Um, yeah, pan that's the Panzer L. Then we get to the Panzer Zug. Um, I want to put this in D tier. However, I do see potentially just running this as like in like an ultra heavy um, German control, like a German control ramp with Reichsbanks or um, exploit the gap or something like that. Like it seems bad. However, I think it's slightly better than these cards that are in uh, D tier right now because the D tier cards are just absolutely awful and you will rarely have a chance to play them. And if you do, their impact will be completely negligible. Whereas Panzer Zug, it's a, not a good card, but if you get to play it, and it's not unreasonable to think that you get to play it, um, its effect is okay. Now, obviously, you would much rather play King Tiger if you're playing it on 12 and then, like, attacking with you guys. Um, and if you're playing it on 9, it's a little slow. It's just sort of like a summon a bunch of stats cards. Um, so, yeah. I have been convinced to move this out of C tier just a little bit, um, or out of D tier into C tier, just because it. At the end of the day, it's it's just a unit that summons a bunch of stats, um, so it's not terrible. Um, and we get to Reich Research, which is going up into S tier. Um, it's it's actually like very much on the edge of S tier and A tier. Um, I'm leaning towards S tier. Just because this card can single-handedly d determine so many games. Um, discarding two at once is incredibly powerful, uh, especially against decks that don't have a ton of draw, like the mirror matchup. Often the mirror matchup is decided by who gets to write research first. Um, write research into urine project is also the only way to counter um, King Tiger in the mirror, um, unless they move to the front line, obviously, uh, or from the deep. But, yeah, and Flying Bomb is by far the best of the Tier 1 researches. Um, and I think a lot of people incredibly underutilize the Synthetic Oil, um, which is the Tier 2 option, the gain 10 credits, because, yeah, sometimes you can just get a ton of stats on the board on turn, like, 7. Like, if you play Synthetic uh, Oil on turn 6, on turn 7, you will have 17 credits, which means you can play, like, a King Tiger and a Jagd Bomber and then you'll probably win the game. Now, obviously, that's a rare situation, but having a card that Tier 1 is insane and Tier 3 is insane, and they will always be insane in almost any matchup, and then you have a Tier 2 option, which will situationally win you the game. It's just a really good card. Um, it doesn't really matter that your own project is laughably bad. Um, yeah, the other two and kind of three options definitely make up for what urine project is lacking um and yeah i can't see you ever not running this in control and you run this very frequently in aggro exclusively for the flying bomb because three credits destroy a unit that costs three or less is really good there's a lot of three cost units that are really that control runs that are really annoying that you were happy to instantly kill um i mean some would die to a sun strike like an 890 or a 845th or an engineer's battalion or a honey um, but yeah, some cost three, so flying bomb, pretty good card. Then we get to Ride of the Valkyries. This card is laughably bad. 
Um, I think it's better than Kriegsmoon and Bismarck and exploit the gap. Maybe slightly worse than Kriegsmoon, but I'll, I'll leave it here, I think. Um, so the recent ride of the Valkyries is very weak. Is it? It's the only one of the uh, cards that, when your opponent takes three damage, that does not trigger on your opponent's turn. Well, it does trigger, but it, it won't do anything because it gives you additional credits for that turn, which it's not your turn, so you can't use those additional credits. Um, so it already has that going against it. If you play this for two and then attack phase for three, you have made up the credits that it costs to play the card in the first place, so you have essentially just disintegrated a card. Um, and if you trigger this twice, you essentially paid a card to gain two credits. It, you know, basically played a war production without discarding, um, which is okay. However, you can't play it on turn one, which is the reason war production is so powerful, is it lets you play three credits worth of stuff on turn one. Um, and yeah, like if you're triggering this three or four times per game, then it, okay, I can see it starting to get better. However, most German decks that, like aggro German decks, don't have a problem with credits per se, because you already have it actually. If you have Greif, if it's a Heinz deck, um, the problem is running out of cards, and getting additional credits doesn't matter if you don't have cards in your hand to use with those additional credits. And this costs a card to give you those additional credits. Also, if you're playing a German aggro deck, you'd rather win the game in like two turns, in terms of like attacking face twice or, or on two different turns, where you get a little bit of chip damage in and then you finish them with a huge Blitzkrieg, then you want to be consistently hitting them for three in a slow grinding style like you might in US midrange. And if this was a US card, you wouldn't run this in US midrange, just because, again, you kind of, you don't want to waste a card on this. Um, now, the reason I put it ahead of Kriegsmarine and Bismarck is because you do run this in um, German France Burn, and you run Kriegsmarine and Bismarck sometimes in German France Burn. Um, however, Rise of the. Or is it Rise or Ride? Ride. Ride of the Valkyries is way, 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 way better in German France Burn because you have a ton of card draw, you have a ton of ways to de trigger this every turn. Um, because you have multiple cards, which are deal 3 damage to the enemy HQ, so you can trigger it once per turn and then draw cards, or you can trigger it once to deal more damage to the enemy HQ. So, it is absolutely insane in German France Burn. However, German France Burn is not particularly good. I do not foresee it becoming particularly better in the future, uh, unless they release some truly broken cards. Um, so, yeah, until then, it's in D tier. It's incredibly good in one deck, and I don't see it being great in any other deck without some massive changes. And last but not least, uh, we have the Tiger IE, which is going into B tier. Um, it has definitely been overshadowed currently by um, the King Tiger, just because of Dechuma, the popularity of Dechuma and... The fact that um, Soviet control is so popular, and Soviet control is has a way harder time dealing with King Tiger than Tiger IE. Um, plus, Tiger IE is very vulnerable to just being retreated by like a Wrath, um, or yeah, it, like a buffed up Hellcat trades with it. However, it's not terrible. Um, if you compare it to Panther G, it it's pretty similar, uh, and people still run Panther G. Now, obviously, Panther G comes out two turns earlier or three turns earlier. Um, however, yeah, there's definitely a world where if you're wanting to run a very heavy deck, you can run King Tiger and Tiger IE and Panther G's. Um, or there's a world where you don't run King Tiger because Soviet control gets less popular, Dachibas sort of go away, you want to play things more on tempo, it's more of a mid-range deck, or you want to play things faster, um, it's more of a mid-range deck, a unit-based deck, um, yeah, a lot of potential there. I'm putting it a bit slightly ahead of Africa Core because I think at the end of the day, you'd probably rather run a King Ti or a Tiger IE on top of the normal elites you would run than an Africa Core. Um, I think it's very close. I think that is the, sort of the question of like how when you go heavy, how much heavy do you go, and what type of heavy you go. But I'll leave it there. 
Um, and yeah, I, I think this is my tier list for the German um, elites. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you agree, disagree. Um, you can put all of that down in the comments or in my Discord. There is a tier lists channel in my Discord where you can see um, other lists that people have made. You can post your own lists. You can comment on other people's lists. It's a whole lot of fun. And this leaves us with just Soviets and Britain, I believe. Um, I actually forget. What I, I, I believe I've done US and Japan. Um, I'm pretty certain. So yeah, I think this leaves us with Soviet and Britain. Let me know which one of those you want to see next. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks very much for watching, guys, if you made it all the way through. And I'll catch you in the next one.